Hello, and welcome to the ASU Sports and Entertainment Law Podcast. My name is Kellen Bradley. And I'm Johnny Sinotis. We're from the ASU Sports and Entertainment Law Journal at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. We are going to bring you guys some more sports and entertainment law news and hopefully some decent analysis today. We're going to start off as usual by telling you that this is not legal advice and the language you're going to hear on here is pretty much just the opinion of Johnny and I. Yep. Do not attribute these views to anyone else at ASU, the Sports and Entertainment Law Journal, or the Sports and Entertainment Law Students Association. All right, enough legal speak. Let's get right to it, jumping right into it. Johnny, you are going to talk about um, a new artist, or is it just a photo or a painting? Um, not necessarily a new artist, but Shepard Ferry, who's the man that uh, basically took the Obama image and put it on the Hope poster. Ah, uh, Okay, I remember now. Right. Um, some of you may know that the Associated Press sued him um, over the copyright of the photograph, and they settled in late January, but now the Associated Press is going after um, smaller merchandisers and clothing retailers such as Urban Outfitters, Nordstrom's, and Zoomies for the use of the image on their apparel. Um, I mean, this is just basic standard copyright infringement claim. Uh, when the AP settled with Ferry in January, they allowed Ferry to continue to use um, the photograph so long as he got a license from the Associated Press. And now they're going to be working together and they're going to go forward with sharing their rights and making posters and merchandise. So I assume much will... Much of the same will be followed with regards to the individual retailers. It just might take a lot longer to work out. Pretty so interesting, only, though. So the only lawsuit was between AP and uh, the digital, I guess, manipulation? Right, his, right. I mean, he there. basically took the photo that was uh, taken by someone at the Associated Press mm -hmm. and basically ran, from, it through from, Photoshop. ran it through Photoshop, made Something. it look somewhat like a painting and then slapped it on posters and stickers and it kind of blew up you can see yeah. it all over the world and when i was in italy two summers ago they had these pictures and paintings everywhere all over the streets so it's obviously in the best interest of the associated press to get the uh get basically the distribution under control so they can get paid for some of their work but at the same time uh Ferry probably took a photo that didn't mean much to many people and made it a huge symbol of not only the president but our nation around the world. So I do think that his being able to profit off of the poster so long as he gets his license, which I, I hear that he has, is a pretty fair settlement to me. How much? Anybody know? Uh, it doesn't say. It didn't disclose numbers or anything. At least 20 bucks. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Cool, very cool. Well, moving right along within the uh, printed image uh, category, well, for those of you who enjoyed the movie Inception, uh, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, directed by Christopher Nolan, <clears throat> this next story might come as somewhat of a shocker, although many of you may have heard about it before. I haven't blogged about it yet, but this is something that I think could become a potentially serious lawsuit. Uh, it turns out that the great idea of jumping into people's dreams and uh, manipulating their actual real world um, from within their dreams, it didn't start just with Wes Craven and uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. It, uh, in fact, was something that was done in the early 2000s by a comic book artist. Um, you familiar with the show DuckTales, Johnny? Yes, I am. You are? Yeah, yeah, I used to like, watch DuckTales growing up all the time. Oh, uh, yeah, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, Gyro Gearloose, the whole gang, <laughs> the Beagles, Beagle Boys. Uh, well, there was a comic book back in the early 2000s that, uh, well, if you set it side by side with the storyboard of Inception is about 98% uh, the spitting image of the story, uh, in my opinion. It's very loco. Did you did you read the whole thing to get a yeah. chance? Yeah, it's outrageous almost. Yeah, it's... Um, uh oh, Johnny's blowing up here. Uh, well, one of the things is you can you can see the uh, the story if you uh, if you just Google Christopher Nolan and Ducktales, it's going to be the first first thing that pops up. This thing is getting uh, viral attention at this point, and there could potentially be a copyright suit coming out of this. But 
who knows? It'll be come up for the uh, finders of fact to figure out. But there are, are plenty of scenes that literally seem to be taken directly from this comic book, which is really, really quite strange. The title of the comic book is Uncle Scrooge, The Dream of a Lifetime. And uh, everything as far as, you know, putting people uh, to sleep, uh, tipping them over to wake them up. Chaining people together while they're sleeping. Different levels. Different levels of sleep going into dreams within dreams can all be found in this very colorful, uh, very provocative uh, comic book. So it's it's something that uh, I kind of made me sad the first time I saw it because Inception, after I saw it, I was like, wow, that was really great. Mind-blowing. It really was, you know, and uh, I loved The Dark Knight. And I thought, you know, Chris Nolan, bravo, you've done it again. <laughs> And uh, sure enough, it took about six months later for me to see, you know, a comic book strip that was written probably seven or eight years before Inception ever came out, uh, was literally Inception in comic book form. So, I mean, different characters, obviously, ducks versus humans and whatnot. Uh, but nonetheless, it'll be interesting to see if this actually gets into court because... As some of you may not know, I mean, copyright infringement in this regard, stealing ideas for stories is a pretty high threshold. You have to have a lot, a lot, a lot of overlapping um, ideas and themes, but it might it might be something that's uh, worthwhile to take to trial in this case because there, at least in my opinion, are a lot, a lot of overlapping um, ideas, sadly. Definitely. Yeah. You really hate to see something like this, though, don't you? Yeah. Well, I mean... We don't know exactly when the idea for Inception began either. It could have been, I mean, 20 years ago. That plot was so convoluted and complicated that mm -hmm. it wouldn't surprise me if it took years for them to get down the basic plot. Mm -hmm. um, and at which point, who knows, maybe the comic book author and the authors of Inception who wrote the screenplay, maybe... Maybe they talk to each other. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes the screenplay or the rough screenplay is, you know, purchased by, you know, the ultimate pen, pen whoever's name is on the uh, screenplay. You buy all the rights, you get to put your name on the screenplay. Yeah. Sometimes that's how it works. It's well, crazy. I'll be paying attention to it for sure. Yeah, we'll definitely follow up with this. Uh, but what's going on with uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Johnny? Um, for those of you who don't know... The Red Hot Chili Peppers recently recorded an album uh, in late October, November. Um, it's set to release sometime late spring or early summer. Unfortunately, it won't feature the guitar wizardry of John Frusciante, but he has been replaced by Josh Klinghoffer, who Frusciante collaborates with on his solo CDs and is also... Um, toured with the Peppers, so it's going to be interesting, but Anthony Kiedis gave an interview to Spin this week about the new album, um, and basically, it sounds like it's going to be much different than anything we've heard from the Chili Peppers before. Flea went back to school to get his uh, doctorate in musical theory, and instead of jamming to come up with songs, they took a very theory-based approach to each track. And in addition, they have a lot of African beat um, underlying every single track because Flea and Josh went to Africa together to study music compositions from that great continent. Um, one thing that I found interesting is that the Chili Peppers never released the name of their album until a week before it comes out, but uh, Anthony Kiedis was nice enough to let us know what the new album's name was, and it's Dr. Johnny Skins's Disproportionately Rambunctious Polar Express Machine Head. And I think that's a fantastic album t title because it's kind of out there. But they got the and it says Johnny and it says Johnny. Um, <laughs> but they got the idea from uh, from a friend. Um, Isn't Machine Head the name of an album by Bush or something like that? Uh, or a song, I don't know, but Bush is awful, so who cares? Uh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Agree to disagree. Rambunctious Railroad? Ah, uh, no, no, no. Johnny Skins' Disproportionately Rambunctious Polar Express Machine Head. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Pretty loco. <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah. It was a friend who dropped by the studio um, and was just telling them a, a story of one of his... Uh, one of his sold-out shows when when he played a song that he entitled right then and there, and they told him that they would make it the working title of their album and decided that that's going to be the real title when it comes to release. So 
Everyone, keep your keep your eyes and ears out for the new album. Uh, it's going to be much different, as I said, theory based approach as opposed to uh, the jam bandy type funk rhythms that we're used to from the Peppers. This, in part, could be contributed to the fact that Fushante isn't in the band anymore, or the fact that they're all getting older. Kiedis is turning 50 pretty soon, has a kid now, and so How old is he? he's 49 right now. He'll be 50 in October. Sweet sassy molasses. Yeah. We've been around for a long time. But anyways, moving on, what do you got for us? Well, as many of you may have heard, if you um, have watched ESPN or any sports news for that matter, that on this past Friday, before the 5 o'clock deadline, the NFL Players Union decertified. And uh, a lot of people have been wondering and asking me, which I do not claim to be an expert, but what it sounds like, the takeaway message from this is that um, the NFL uh, no longer has antitrust protection in this regard, and the players can sue for antitrust in federal court, which, according to NFL.com, is exactly what 10 players have already done, even just be- just after um, the uh, decertification Friday. So this goes back to something that we've been blogging about on and off throughout the entire year, uh, about you know the billionaires versus the millionaires, the coaches, or no, sorry, the owners versus the players. And um, it seems in this regard that it might be a little bit more likely now that the uh, Players Association is decertified, it might be a little bit more likely that there is an actual 2011 season, which would be great. That would be very great. I couldn't really imagine a, a fall without football. Yeah. Or fantasy football, for that matter. No, I don't think they'll let that happen either. Um, but... They still have a lot of things to work out. Yeah, they certainly do. And they really haven't been highlighting a lot of the issues as well as probably they should be. But there's a huge disparity in some of the um, contracts between the minimum, what the minimum player makes, and what players like Peyton Manning and Tom Brady are making, and uh, insurance issues. I've been reading tweets all weekend about players complaining that they had to go out and get insurance. (laughs) Oh, poor guys. (laughs) But... At the same time, hopefully they can dissolve and resolve rather all these uh, issues um, before summer and uh, really get the teams focused in on you know actually having a 2011 season. But what would you think would happen if they didn't have a season next year? <sighs> Tom United, Brady would start acting. <laughs> United Football League? Maybe. Canadian would you, football would become more prominent, that's for sure. Would you want your player to go risk injury in the United Football League? Mm. Probably not. Probably not. Or would you rather him just go to like a private workout facility to stay in incredible shape? I would think a uh, private workout facility would be better. I mean, no other football league compares to the National Football League. And uh, I think players shouldn't compromise their ability to come back and play when the NFL does does come back from these negotiations. I don't think it's worth it to go play in a substandard league. Mm-hmm. Um because one, it's substandard, but two, I don't see very many players, especially the best players in the league, playing in the UFL. Mm-hmm. I see them taking the time off, staying in shape, and probably pursuing other avenues that they want to do once they get done playing football that they can do now. What about the other players that are maybe making the minimum special teamers? They have a chance maybe to go to the UFL or even Canadian Football League, go in there, put up some serious numbers. Yeah, I mean, it took their stock. It could be a great opportunity for the lower-level players, for sure, especially when they're competing with people that that don't have the quality of those that play in the National Football League. Um, But on the whole, I I don't think the UFL or the Canadian Football League would be able to stand in the shoes of the NFL at all. Mm -hmm. And you know what's strange? I was at the uh, Chamber of Commerce the other day having this discussion with some folks, and the really people who lose here is nowhere near the owners. And it's, again, like we said before, the millionaires versus the billionaires. And uh, when you don't have a 2011 season, uh, you don't have any games in any stadiums. And when you don't have games in any stadiums, you don't have any trickling business around those stadiums. You don't have people going out and shopping, creating a day, creating a week, creating a vacation out of a football game. You don't have uh, TV people doing commentating uh, no podcasts after games, none of that stuff. You don't it's have a huge... hangover cure from Saturday night? There you go. There you go. You don't have a hangover cure from Saturday night or Saturday or Friday night, depending on who's playing on Saturday. True. But the takeaway message is, and I mean, 
not a lot of good could come from no no NFL season. Maybe uh could be MLS's most popular season That's in, true. in its that, history. That would actually be to my advantage. I would love to see the MLS become more prominent. Yeah, I'd definitely get out to an LA Galaxy game or three. I speaking of that, this past week, um, on Tuesday night at the Phoenix or at the University of Phoenix uh, Stadium, I watched the New York Red Bulls play their last preseason game against the Mexican team Atlas. <sighs> what did you call me? <laughs> I thought you knew about it, but I I got to see um, Rafa Marquez, who spent his entire career with Barcelona, Barcelona. and he's the captain of the Mexican national team, and Thierry Henry mm. play right in front of me. You know what? I think I did read about that on AC Central the next day. Yeah. 24,000 people showed up, and it's a shame that Phoenix doesn't have an MLS soccer team because that would the be, market's here. Yeah, that would be uh, very huge. I mean, if you look at it, California, Arizona, Texas, and Florida mm-hmm. have the best club soccer in the U.S. And why why doesn't Arizona have a soccer well, here's team? Well, the counter-argument to that. Arizona already has a Major League Baseball, Major League Football, Major Basketball, and Major Hockey. And I think we only have, what, one championship between all of them? <laughs> championship, championship. Yeah, I get what you're saying, though. I, I think it would be really cool, especially at the University of Phoenix Stadium. Is it turf in there? It's not turf, is it? No, no. It's oh, nice okay. grass. Um, I think it's certainly... Make a creative practice facility. For preserve. sure. I mean, there are tons of fields around Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Um, you could just renovate an existing stadium and yeah. throw down a soccer field. It'd yeah, I, I think the demographics and the uh, actually geographic arrangement of Arizona is perfect for um, uh, soccer. Yeah. yeah. So uh, anyway, back to uh, Johnny. Uh, tell us about Sidney Crosby and what you hear about that. Oh, yeah. There's been rumors that Sidney Crosby... Uh, is being urged by his family and those close to him to retire from the NHL because of his string of For those who don't know Sidney Crosby, want to... Oh, yeah, yeah. Sidney Crosby um, is is a National Hockey League player. He's actually a star. He's been in the league for six years. He's 23 now. He's got tons of awards. He's got a Stanley Cup championship to his name. For those um, of you who missed it, he was in the NHL at 17. Right. Um and he plays for the Pittsburgh Penguins, um, but he's suffered a few concussions, and rumors came out this week that he's being urged to retire. Is it just a few? Or? Um, I don't know the actual number of concussions that he has. Let me, let me try and look that up for you. Um, but either way, he's coming back. He's in his third month of his last concussion recovery, and some reports say that he's not doing that great, and... Um, Although there are rumors that he's been urged to retire by his family, his father came out and completely refuted the rumor. Um, I mean, the people that that disclosed this rumor came from a Toronto radio report. Um, they were very short-lived. His father, Troy, came out and said that it's completely preposterous in so many words. Um, but, I mean... We'll see what happens. This was just reported this weekend, so it's it's going to be interesting. Yeah, that is. Um, we've just had several uh, cases that we've reported on the blog about people being uh, injured uh, by concussions and their serious damage. And even just recently, about a month ago, <clears throat> ASU's quarterback, uh, Stephen Three. From who was a transfer from Michigan and started last year uh, most of the season, stepped away and quit football uh, just about a month ago. And uh, looking and pointing to the concussions that he's had, I think it was four and five years, according to uh, the USA Today, and uh, saying that, you know, in light of those, he didn't want any more injuries, any more permanent damage to, I guess, his brain and body. So uh, he had to step away from football, and it's... um. It's kind of strange. I mean, especially a well, quarterback, you can definitely tell. I mean, quarterbacks sort of get – they're a little bit more vulnerable, I think, when they get hit. A lot of the times they're not expecting it. Uh, just look at Steve Young. I mean, how many concussions did that guy have? That's, Six um, or seven, perhaps. Troy Aikman, too. Yeah. In my uh, career, I think I've probably had a three, maybe four. But I can tell you, they're not fun. And you get hit, and then the next few days, you, you're just out of it. You don't want to drive. You don't want to uh, – sit up quickly or anything like that and uh it's kind of scary to think that your brain is swelling with inside within your skull and um 
trying not to have any permanent damage. And who was the other guy? Brandon Mayweather, Mayweather we found out as well. Oh, right. yeah. Mayweather didn't have a concussion. He apparently shot somebody, but we're not positive. Right. Yeah, maybe we can uh, pull up that report. Yeah, let's get down to One it. of the um, NA- NFL uh, helmet-to-helmet hits, I'm not, which probably resulted in a concussion, was Brandon Mayweather from the... Um, Patriots, safety for the Patriots. Right, safety for the Pats. And, uh, yeah, he reported on one of his hits, which uh, garnered him a pretty substantial fine last season. But what happened to him the other night? Um, charged, accused, charged with murder or convict charged? Nah, he's accused of shooting two men during a brawl. Um, fortunately, he didn't seriously injure either of them. Um, he grazed someone in the face. But what oh, happened man. was on February 27th, um, allegedly... Meriwether's friend beat up a woman at a bar. That woman's brother came to the bar. They moved to a party where the fight broke out again. Meriwether's friend was getting the shorter end of the stick in the fight. Mm. Meriwether allegedly pulled out a gun, um, fired a few shots, hit the person that was fighting his friend and another man who apparently is a distant cousin of Meriwether's. Uh, I'm I'm not really sure. Wow, that's nothing good. Nothing good at all. No, nothing good. It's not good for the Pats for football no. for the families involved. That's uh, that's really unfortunate. That's why you don't fight people. Period. Yeah. You never know who's got a gun. Yeah. Listen to that, boys and girls. Yeah. Especially yeah. those living here in Arizona. Yeah. Uh, well, moving on. Last week. Uh, I wrote a recap piece that followed up on an original article written about Alberto Contador, perhaps the most famous uh, performance-enhancing drug case that has happened with uh, cycling and uh, doping. Alberto Contador appeared before the um, Spanish authorities and the Spanish courts uh, in January, or February rather, and uh, they cleared him after he defended himself that he ate contaminated beef, and that was why they found clenbuterol in his system during the Tour de France last year, and uh, which was a huge win for Contador, who got to go back, and his suspension was uh, preemptively lifted uh, following that case. The case, however, is most likely going to be appealed to the uh, Court of Arbitration for Sport which is the main governing body um, for international sports. That's in Switzerland, and you don't want to go to that court. You never want to have to go to that court, but um, Alberto Contador has to do it, and where he's going to continue to defend that he ate contaminated beef, and that's why he had a banned substance in his system. And uh, heavily stacked against his favor because the court has never accepted the contaminated food defense and have always... um, kept hard to their strict liability policy, except from a few several exceptions, most often when um, the actual uh, testing process was uh, uh, when the testing process was uh, faulty or when they made mistakes in the lab. So we'll follow up with that once that happens in, um, who knows, the next few months. But in the meantime, Alberto Cantador is going to be training, um, riding up hills and uh, cycling with his teammates as if he's going to have a season and uh, be cleared, free and clear, which will set some precedent, and um, it'll probably strike down the strict liability policy um, for performance-enhancing drugs. So we'll see. We shall see. It'd be a big step if they were to do that, in my opinion. But Yeah, it is kind of strange. I, I mean, one of the takeaway messages that I wrote in the blog article is that um, all over the world, farmers are legally, and, and in some cases illegally, just pumping their livestock full of um, chemicals and substances that make their livestock grow big and huge so they can make more money. How, right. how weird is that, you know? And then they turn around and they give it strict liability to athletes who are probably exposed to, you know, said livestock every city they potentially go to. Right. And um, oftentimes, I mean, it's a laundry list if you look at banned substances. There's thousands, hundreds, hundreds if not thousands of uh, new substances that they're adding all the time. And uh, using a strict liability policy doesn't really seem fair uh, in all aspects. Some of the, some of the times, especially with uh, Tong Wen, who was a Japanese judo champion, or Chinese judo champion, she had over 100 negative tests before, you know, one positive test. Right. Very strange. Took away her world championship. Couldn't go to the 
Beijing Olympics to defend her world title. Sad, sad stuff, all on account of the strict liability policy. But then again, you know, rules are rules. So we shall see. Power moves. Power moves. <laughs> well, that's it for us this week. Thanks for joining us on the spring break edition of the ASU Sports and Entertainment Law Podcast. Again, my name is Kellen Bradley. And I'm Johnny Snotis. Tune in next week. Have an awesome spring break, you guys. Be sure to check out our webpage, which is asusportslaw.wordpress.com which is going to be completely revamped, and we're going to be rolling out a new blog site. So pay attention online. That's going to happen within the next uh, week or so. Looking forward to it. Check it out. Enjoy your spring break. Yeah, big shout-out to the Sports Entertainment Law Journal, keeping it fresh with the latest issues and analysis. Thanks a lot for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.